Is it really only August 11th? Well, with uh, still over two weeks to go until the F1 summer break ends, we look back on the first 13 races today to bring you our traditional Grid Talk half-term report card. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. My name is Tom Horrocks. This is episode 222. And today on one of our fireside specials, we enlist the help of someone very adept in driver ratings and uh, and he's been doing it for as long as I can remember. So welcome to the podcast today, Mr. Ed Straw. It's very rare for people to say I'm good at driver ratings. Normally I'm told I'm terrible at them. So that's a very, very promising start. So thanks very much for having me on. <laughs> no problem. It's apps always welcome. And also joining us today, we've got uh, motorsport writer Aaron Harper from the Five Red Lights podcast. Hi, Aaron. Hello, Tom. Hello, Ed. Fantastic. So uh, before we before we upset lots of people, we'd like you to, to pause this podcast and go and leave us a five star rating on Spotify and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us climb the rankings and you'll even get a shout out on the show and a thank you if you do that for us. So as well as these fireside chats, we do live previews, reviews and analysis of every race weekend, which goes out live on YouTube. We also put that out on the audio platforms shortly after as well. So just search for F1 Chronicle on YouTube or go to F1Chronicle.com to find out more. So today we're going to be, as I said, we're going to be doing the uh, the, the racing system of our, of our drivers from our from our sofas racing these elite sportsmen and, and telling them how good and bad they are. So I'm sure they'll be listening to this and, and taking on board all of our positive criticism and, and, and negative wherever that is. So what we're going to do is we've put our all of all of the drivers to our grid talk crew. We've had about 15 people come back with ratings for us, and uh, we've we've rated them from from A plus down to F. And we're going to be speaking to to the panelists today as well to get their ratings and why. So uh, we'll be starting off with the F category, which is a category all all on his own. Unsurprisingly, it's Nicholas Latifi has uh, has got a rating of, of F. The only person on Grid Talk to not give him an F was actually, uh, in fact, no, I, I, I beg your pardon, I only gave him an E. It's, it's yourself, Aaron. You gave him a C. Now, uh, initially, that really made my eyes pop out. But then I looked at it and realized that C was actually your lowest grading you gave someone. So do you want to explain that? Yeah, well. I think we have to bear in mind that this is a brand new rule set. So we're still learning about how the actual philosophy of the rules works and how it puts itself onto the racetrack. And for Latifi, obviously he's found the transition difficult. So I think to, to just slam him with an F would be a bit harsh. And I've tried to be as fair as possible to everyone, considering that they're all doing something that I definitely can't do. So you know, I think a C is fair because he's trying and there's been improvement. So if, he, if he'd just been languishing in the back, finishing, you know, last and second last in pretty much every race, I think we'd be looking at maybe D, E or F. But I think, you know, th there's a bit of improvement there. He's fighting for his drive and it's hard to see how he keeps his seat. But, you know, th there's a bit of development there. And we know what he is capable of because last year in a, developing Williams he was able to deliver point scoring finishes it's a fair rationale and uh, if, if you'd have given him a C and given other people D's E's and F's then maybe I, I might have argued a bit more vociferously on that but uh, Ed, any uh, any advancements on that anything you, you would like to add to that I, I basically agree with uh, with what Aaron was saying although because I like to use or try and use the whole range of, of ratings I would have to go F for the Tifi but as it always is with these ratings, it depends on exactly how you calibrate things, etc. And Latifi's been an interesting case because he did have the problems earlier in the season, lack of confidence. He had a change of chassis at Silverstone. And since then, he has improved. He's still, even with that, been a little bit frustratingly erratic at times. Silverstone was probably his best weekend, all things considered. He had flashes in Hungary, topping FP3, had the third fastest first sector time of qualifying of any driver in Hungary as well, just really well put together sector but it just hasn't quite meshed together for him so it's a little bit harsh but using the whole gamut the whole spread of the uh the, the ratings I, I kind of have to go with f for him unfortunately okay so i'm somewhere in the middle there i've gone for e on that as well i think the the highest person that rated him that didn't use the uh the, the full scale was owain who gave him a d very very generous there for, for owain but uh we don't actually have anyone at all in the e category so as i was genuine when i said he's got that entire part of the field all to himself but next and anyone in the d category this is in no particular order it's just how they've come out so the first person we're going to talk about in the d category is mclaren's daniel ricardo so he currently he 
currently lies very far down the championship, just the nine, just nineteen points way off his teammate. Is a racing fair, Ed, or are we being particularly harsh to him? Yeah, I think it's fair ultimately. In fact, I've been looking at my sort of ratings. I maybe even have him in the E in my ultra harsh grading, but nobody would claim that Ricardo's been doing the job he should be doing. Least of all, Ricardo himself. He's really struggled to get dialed into the car. He was hoping for much better things this year after the work he put in last year, but it's it's just not working. Norris is showing what that car can do. Ricardo at his best is still kind of a couple of tenths off Norris and he struggles to string together the whole weekends as well. So you might you quite often see these races where he has one good stint and then he might go on to a harder tire and he struggles a lot more. It's been quite frustrating to see. So it's this complete discontinuity of his season. It's just been sort of bouncing around between average and and poor ultimately a real shame we know what he can do but you just can't really argue him to be any higher so d e both seem reasonable ratings to me yeah it's it just like you say bouncing around is the is the perfect description because we get like a, from the sixth place in austria to the uh to our 18th in in imola and then we've got an eighth in baku followed by an 11th in canada and then we got a 15th in hungary following a ninth place in france so it is just it is just bouncing around those those low points positions and sometimes just completely way out of the points. And it went from that amazing double overtake in, in Hungary to then just completely into subscu- into obscurity for, uh, apart from you know hard tyres aside, for no real reason. But I think that's that's completely fair to be honest. Having him in that in that D category, Aaron, any advancements on that? The only note I've got next to Ricardo is what hasn't been said already. This is true. I, th- yeah. I think that kind of sums up his first half of the season because he had it all the way through 2021 where he was getting beaten by Norris. Yeah, he got that win in Monza and that was Daniel Ricciardo at his best. If you give him a car that works and you get him at the front, he's the sort of guy who's going to be able to deliver for you. But this year, he's not been able to tune himself into the car the same sort of way as Norris has. Again, he's, like you say, bouncing around in the the lower top 10, upper midfield, or the upper teens and stuff for... For finishing positions, his best finish is a sixth place, which he got in Australia, and that was round three. So nothing above an eighth place since then. I think that just tells you exactly where Ricardo is. And is it any surprise that Oscar Piastri is being linked with that seat? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll ask you this, Ed, because you're probably in a better position than I to, to, to know, but can you foresee a situation where Daniel Ricciardo doesn't see out the season with Oscar Piastri not racing anywhere at the moment? Can you see that happening early or is that going to be pipe dream stuff? I wouldn't rule anything out the way things have been going the past few weeks, but I suspect probably not. You never know. There could be some deal that's agreed, but I would be expecting Ricardo to see out the season unless there's some bizarre agreement that's, that's struck possible but I think they'll be better off with Ricardo seeing out the season as well and he'll probably want to have the chance to finish at McLaren and possibly an F1 entirely on a high yeah, I think um, I, I really want him to to see out the season and, and have a few good box office results as well, just to end his time at McLaren well, at least just to, to show that, you know, at least show another team that there is still that steely fighter still in there. But the next person in, in the D category, and this is someone I, I, at the start of the season, if you just said that we'd have been talking about him third in our in our driver racings, I, I would have been absolutely shocked. And that is Pierre Gasly drops into the D category today. The highest grade anyone from Grid Talk gave him was a C, multiple people gave him a C but the majorities were, were were D's. Aaron where did where did you rate where did you rate Gasly overall? Uh I believe I gave him a C. I will uh, double check. I think you probably did. You did. Yeah, so did. just as good as Latifi then. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the thing is with Gasly, he we know what he can do. He's a race winner. But he struggled early on, but he seems to be getting exact together in terms of getting on top of Sonoda. The AlphaTauri car hasn't been as strong as in 2021 so he hasn't been able to show as prominently towards the top of the midfield and even to the front of the grid because he started on the front row at one point last year so obviously he's been hampered by that but we we do know how how well he can drive and I think he's starting to get on top of things in that car he's locked in for another year with Alpha Tauri which does seem to be sort of this endless cycle of debate of will he won't he but all the other places that he could possibly go to seem to be getting eaten up by drivers coming from Formula 2 or from outside the picture or just by Fernando Alonso because he seems to be getting around the grid plenty. Yeah, it's, a, it's a strange one for Gasly because he's, he's had a, a fifth place finish in Azerbaijan where he tends to go really well but then his next best two finishes are eighth and ninth 
and then everything else has been outside the point. So I just I feel like he's been inhibited by the car, which just isn't as strong as 2021. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. And Ed, anything to add on that? And or do you think that? And also, do you think that Pierre Gasly maybe is suffering a little bit of buyer's remorse signing that contract so early, given what's happened in the summer? Yeah, I think he was pretty much stuck there with the, the contract he had, so he didn't have a great deal of choice of the matter, unfortunately. But ultimately, I've got Gasly more a C on my rating, which is uh, probably even more generous than <laughs> than Aaron's. But I haven't been massively impressed with parts of Gasly's season but I think he has been quite unlucky if you think of Monaco where he had the pace to be on the third row and he just got timed out in qualifying because there was the red flag and Alfa Tauri were very slow in letting him out Miami should have scored points Alonso hit him Bahrain he lost points recently he struggled a bit he's not the most adaptable driver that's his biggest problem and sometimes when the car dynamics aren't quite there particularly if he's got a bit too much understeer for his liking he does struggle so it's not necessarily a strong C, but I think there have been some good signs. His race in Hungary, for example, was was a good race performance. He recovered pretty well, considering the, the track he was racing on. So it's fine, sort of in the middle. But yeah, you know, I'd rank him above a, a few other drivers who I think are down in the sort of D, E grade vicinity. Yeah, as well, we there was that section of the season uh, sort of fairly early on where it seemed every race Lewis Hamilton was stuck behind Pierre Gasly, and and um, so he's definitely shown that he's he's got that that racecraft in there certainly for defending. But then there's been far too many incidents where he's been the one getting involved in collisions and and uh, compromising his own races as well, which is something that we we were kind of putting more akin to his teammate last season. But uh, speaking of his teammate, he also falls under that D category. Yuki Tsunoda next up for him improvement from last. Last year, Ed, or is he uh, back still the, the same old Sonoda? Yeah, it is an improvement from last year. <laughs> and I'm kind of having to put him at the level of E, which feels a bit harsh, but the high points have been good and there have been some very, very good performances. He's had a little bit of bad luck. Baku, he finished sixth, but he had that DRS problem, qualified well in Q3 at Paul Ricard, but Ocon clobbered him on the first lap. The past few races, he's struggled a bit. He's had a few races where he's just vanished with mysterious grip problems. Austria was one of them and Hungary was another. The team found no car problem or anything. So he's struggled a bit since the car's been updated as well. But he has put in some really compelling performances. Imola was another good one. So I think, although I'm rating him fairly low, I think he has cut back on the errors. The pace is coming on. He's had a number of weekends where he's been quicker than Gasly. So he's getting there. Not quite as quickly as he should do, and there's still concerns about his overall temperament. By his own admission, he gets a little bit too overexcited, particularly over the radio, which everybody's heard. So there's promising signs. The peaks are really good, but the overall average gets dragged down by some bad weekends and then stupid moments like driving into his teammate at Silverstone. Yeah, we, and we can always be guilty of forgetting just how young some of these people are. I mean, you, you just got to look at that picture that's floating around on social media with Pierre Gaz, not Pierre Gaz, sorry, with Yuki Tsunoda as, as a child in little Wellington boots standing next to Fernando Alonso's World Championship uh, McLaren car. So it, it just goes to show just how young this this guy actually is. And uh, and we need to give these youngsters time to develop. But equally, it's, a, it's supposed to be the best 20 drivers in the world. I, I think Red Bull are currently in a bit of a situation where they don't really have a natural successor for him I think if they did then potentially he would have been replaced but uh, short of say uh, Jane Deruvla or uh, Dennis Hauger there's not really anyone waiting to take that place and no one really grabbing Formula 2 by the scruff of the neck and and putting pressure on Red Bull saying come on I'm your next guy so it's uh, it, it's a difficult situation for, for Red Bull and Sonoda certainly looks like he's may well be given a third third crack at it but uh, may well be win, win or bust for him now what's your thoughts Aaron? Uh, well, I was impressed with Snowder's start to the season because, like Ed said, there was a lot of mistakes last year and he was very crash-happy. It was a bit of a throwback to uh, Takuma Sato in so many ways. But he's really tidied things up this year and the, the start of the season was good, but I spotted in my uh, sort of note-taking before this, he's not scored a point since Spain. That was in, like, May. That, that's a long time. I know Alfa Tauri have not scored in the last five, so it tells you sort of where the cars are in terms of performance and maybe what, whether, you know, the, the various inc incidents they're having between the two drivers and within the actual races themselves are just holding the team back and the drivers back. But he's had a promising start to the season. Hopefully he can sort of reset and reboot 
over the summer and come back in Belgium and be just as quick and feisty as we know he can be. But that, again, that, that depends on how well the car suits various circuits. And con- considering it's a brand new generation of car, we're learning at every single circuit we go to. Yeah, I think if you uh, if you put this year's Sonoda in last year's car, we may well see a slightly different slightly different story. But I think the car is is the biggest limiting factor currently in uh, in AlphaTauri, not the drivers themselves. Just six points finishes between them, three each, and just Gasly's one peak in uh, it was a Baku, the fifth place, I think it was. Yeah, uh, that was the only one that's really the the outlier that puts him ahead of Sonoda in the championship. So big upgrades needed for for AlphaTauri to to really allow the drivers to show what they can do because it's kind of stalling both of their careers at the moment. Moment. But the next person we're going to talk about is uh, is Lance Stroll, also in the D category, probably the highest he's been rated for a little while for us. But uh, another indifferent season. But the car is is particularly bad, and his teammate, we're not sure if he's if he's phoned it in or if Stroll is getting closer to him. But they do seem to be closer. Aaron, what's your thoughts on Lance Stroll's season so far, and, and what did you grade him as? Uh, so I believe I'm just checking. I've graded Lance as a C because I, I, he gets a lot of stick on social media because obviously his dad owns the team so there's all these accusations of nepotism but we've seen sort of maybe the the best example is in football so you see sons of ex-footballers coming through academies and uh frank lampard he his dad was on the coaching team when he came through at west ham and there was accusations of nepotism there so you if your family are involved in running of any sort of business or sport there's always accusations of nepotism but that shouldn't take away from Lance's performances he's got 10 he's got 10th place four times this year in an Aston Martin car that has in fits and starts been okay in that they're, they're developing the car they've brought two significant upgrades at Spain and at Silverstone so it's moving in the right direction I don't think Lance is a world driver's champion in waiting but he's learning from Sebastian Vettel he's going to be learning from Fernando Alonso next if Lawrence Stroll's master plan is to turn his son into a world champion by getting him to sponge off of former world champions then maybe that that might work but it's been decent not spectacular from Lance for me it's kind of okay Right, fair enough. And uh, just just ask Stoffel van Dorn what it's like to learn from a two time world champion. Uh, he's a, seems to be a bit of a career killer, Fernando Alonso. Ed, any any thoughts on Lance Stroll? And how did you grade him for the year so far? Yeah, a little bit lower, just because I'm being more harsh with the grades. He's kind of high E, low D. He, he is perfectly solid, a perfectly decent Grand Prix driver. He's had a perfectly reasonable season. His high points aren't super high. They're they're decent. He's had a few low points, but he's had some nice tidy race drives to 10th. I think to take that footballer analogy, he's perhaps less Frank Lampard Jr., a bit more Darren Ferguson, if you were to go with uh, with football managers and sons, but uh, or football coaches and sons. But yeah, he's absolutely he's competent. He's a safe pair of hands. He's delivering pretty well, but no more than that. So yeah, he's not bad. He's not a disaster. He's not incompetent or anything, but you can see in the other car, Vettel has some higher peaks. And that's what Stroll struggles, particularly this year, to access. Difficult car, certainly. But, yeah, nothing absolutely remarkable. He never kind of takes the car by the scruff of the neck and takes it right to the edge of where it can go. But he's usually doing okay in it. I think that's just the the word I'd use to describe him. Okay. Yeah, I think OK is is the the best description you can ever use to describe Lance Stroll's career in Formula One. It's just it's just OK. Yeah, is is there's been a couple of peaks. You, know, you just look at the the pole position in Turkey, and then you've got the uh, the race in Baku where he got pit by Bottas on the line. So there's the odd, the odd peak in there, but the the troughs are just just far too frequent for for him to be this kind of this great white hope for the Stroll family to get a world championship in there. But his teammate is the next person we're going to talk about. But he does that Sebastian Vettel does move into the C category. He's the first person we're going to talk about in the C category. I personally gave Sebastian Vettel, I should have checked before I said this, uh, I can't even find him on the list now. Uh, I gave, yeah, I gave him a D. Thank you very much. Yeah, so he, he's on the D category for me. I just feel that he's a, he's a little uh, a little uh, disappointing this year, but maybe he's uh, he's got good reason to to not really care about that anymore. Ed, what's your thoughts on Sebastian Vettel? This in his what we now know is his swan song. Yeah, peaks have been good. Emila was a really good one when the car wasn't strong, qualified well in the wax. Uh, good results. 
he's had a little bit of a frustrating tendency to drop in the odd mistake, which is not unusual for Vettel in recent times. For example, Baku, where he had a really good result, but he did chuck it up the escape road at one point. That probably didn't change his result, but it did cost him time during the race. And you tend to look out for things like that just because you've got away with it in terms of your race result and he's still been able to finish six doesn't mean that the error didn't happen. But yeah, he's the one who's had those more obvious moments of magic in the in the Aston Martin. And it's been a difficult car because particularly in qualifying, it, it struggles and he's strung together some decent race drives. So yeah, he's kind of, I think he probably just creeps into the C category for uh, for me, you could say high D. A low C, probably just a, a low C for him overall. So he's still performing at a good level and, and he could have carried on, but obviously he's decided it's going to be his final season and he can go out performing still at a very, very respectable level. Yeah. Aaron, another C? Yeah, another C. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he's just been hamstrung by an underwhelming car at the start of the season. I think some of his decision might have hinged on how competitive the Aston Martin was out of the blocks for this year, and it wasn't. And he's got so many other things that he's passionate about. And uh, yeah, it's just the, the the solid performances have been good. Like Ed said, in Azerbaijan, he's picked up P6. But there was that glaring error, which may not have changed his uh, finishing position. But it, you know, he could have got track position in a timely safety car. He could have been right place, right time. Obviously, that, that never happened. But for Seb, it's... it's it's uh, it's been a decent season again because the car is tricky to drive, and like Ed said, the the high points have been have been much higher than that of Lance Stroll when he's able to take things to the limit. But then there is the expectation from him because he is a four time world champion, fifty three time Grand Prix winner, that he's able to do that, and people maybe expect a little bit more from him, and then judge him accordingly rather than looking at where his performance level is at the moment. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's a fair point. Absolutely fair point. Um, it's I, I guess with four world championships hanging around your neck, that's uh, you do become a bit of a target with with bad performances, and uh, not really been the the same driver the last few years, has he? Ed? He's definitely uh, he seems to be a different driver now to what he was when he first went to Ferrari. Yeah, it's an interesting case, Vettel. He's almost had a, a front loaded career, you could say, in terms of the success with all championships with Red Bull, but. Yeah, I think he's sort of hit a ceiling of, adap of adaptability that's held him back. There are areas where he has been very adaptable. He's great at adapting to the blown diffuser era, but that also gave him the characteristics that he thrived with. And I think that's probably been the story of his later career, just struggled to be consistent and then eliminate those uh, those mistakes. But it's it's nice that he's had this, this two-year code with Esther Martin. I think it's allowed him to go out perhaps a bit more on his own terms and in a slightly happier way than had it just been walking away after Ferrari dropped him. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, at the end of his time at Ferrari was going to spill the end of his career. I actually predicted it for the, when Leclerc signed for Ferrari. I said next year will be Vettel's last year and I thought I was going to be proved right. But uh, glad in the end that he uh, he was able to to at least get this, this, this next spell of his career under his belt and, and really kind of go into the hearts of the Formula One community a lot more. The last few years, I think he, he was very much limited by what he could say and do at Ferrari. And and uh, he's really let his personality come out in Aston Martin. And he's seen much, much more favorably, favorably as a sportsman and a human being than he was during his time at Ferrari, definitely. But the next person we're going to speak about is someone who may eventually end up at Ferrari. You never know. It's uh, it's Mick Schumacher. Uh, once again, we'll, we won't mention the nepotism <laughs> that we mentioned before, but uh, certainly an indifferent season. Started off very, very difficult for him, then seemed to level out and got a little bit better and then was linked with that Aston Martin drive as well, Ed. And what's your thoughts on, on Schumacher's, Schumacher's season and his, uh, his prospects for the future as well? Yeah, it's disappointing, ultimately, the season. It's not done his prospects for the future much. Good. He was in quite a nice situation this year because in Magnussen he had, yes, an experienced teammate, but someone who's, he's not the absolute fastest qualifier, so he's beatable if you want to be a Ferrari driver. And that's obviously the, the target he's pursuing. And really, there have been a few too many mistakes, a few too many off weekends. He had that good run. Canada, Silverstone, Austria were, were pretty good. France and Hungary were fine, but not more than that. The big crash in Saudi, uh, the mistake at Monaco, obviously, as well. So, yeah, he's been he's been... Just a bit disappointing. The thing that I do like is the fact he's kept his head, he's battled on, he's been able to recover partly after that bad start. So I'm quite interested to see how he gets on after the break because at his best, he has been 
genuinely impressive. It's just that has not happened enough. So, yeah, hopefully there is a bit more to come from him. But I think right now he's trying to prove himself and stay on the grid for next year rather than trying to get himself a, a move to a, a much bigger team. I think that's going to be in the more distant future if indeed it ever happens. So I've kind of got him at an E overall with my ultra harsh grading. Peaks are good, but yeah, there's been too much just average or outright disappointing and bad, unfortunately. Yeah, I was I was a D for Mick Schumacher personally. It was uh, after a pretty much a throwaway season last year. He was under no pressure at all. And I think he's shown now this season after a rocky start that he's he's keeping his head and he is actually showing a, a showing something. Because last year, you can't even compare last season because it was just the car was nowhere. The, the teammate was nowhere. And it's just impossible to, to grade him really on that. So I see this as more of his rookie season than last year. But uh, certainly, if he does get a drive for next year, if he doesn't perform next year, then for me, that's the, the experiment over. Over. Yeah. Your your thoughts, Aaron? Another C? Yeah, uh, Nick got a C from me because I, th- I think he's resur- he's recovered his season quite nicely because it would have been very easy for him to to see his chin drop uh, around the Monaco crash time because he'd had the big crash in Saudi, a new teammate coming in and beating him when he'd kind of ruled the roost last year and almost like you say had no pressure. I always I always think we should caveat the Mick Schumacher conversation with the home situation that must be incredibly difficult to deal with even if you are a elite sports person so i think for him to to have even got to this point where he's fighting for his career and able to keep his head above water so to speak that is you know that is a, tells you a lot about his character so if you can get him that extra year i think he'll get that extra year at, at Haas, and then maybe he'll move to someone else from there but it speaks to his character really really importantly and sometimes in a team they they'll take the person who is going to be best for the atmosphere if you look at the the Bottas Hamilton partnership that thrived so well because Bottas didn't rock the boat and it gave Hamilton a platform to go and be absolutely stratospheric Mick Schumacher could be that sort of driver he won't want to be but he he could be and if he if he wants to be a Ferrari driver that's what he might have to turn himself into and become one of those very good racing drivers, but not one of the greats. But he's got the right temperament and character, I think, and he's showing that to handle another year and maybe handle a step up in competitiveness in the future. Well, I genuinely hope he does, and because uh, he seems like a, a, a jolly nice fellow, and I'd love to see him do well, but uh, I, I'm a little bit unsure that that's going to happen. But we come to our, um, well, the 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 only rookie, I believe, this season, Guan Yu Zhou, is, is next up on the list here. He is also in the C category, but this is one of the people, Aaron, that you didn't give a C to. Do you want to explain your, your rating for uh, Zhou Guan Yu today? So I've given him an A because he has thoroughly surprised me in how well he's equipped himself. And this is another driver who is showing that he's got the right temperament and character for what is required of him because he's had such rotten luck with with reliability. Alfa Romeo have had the worst reliability on the grid, I believe. And there was was a few races sort of around the Baku, Miami uh, period where he was doing well, but... As soon as his name popped up on the team radio on the TV, you knew the car was going to be retired. But he's responded to that. He's picked up a few points, finishes in Canada. He got the P8. um, He's got another 10th place and a couple of 11th places. And obviously, he's come back from that terrifying crash at Silverstone. So he's definitely exceeding expectations. And I think if you rate drivers based on where you think where you'd expect them to be and what you expected from them at the start of the season, Joe is absolutely smashing everyone's expectations of him. Okay, that's 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 fair enough. I mean, personally, my, my expectations for for Joe were 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 quite low to begin with. So I agree that he has he has definitely uh, exceeded expectations there. I just I, I can't get behind your rating of an A though. Unfortunately, <laughs> for me, that's that's just a little little too little too high. Ed, uh, any any thoughts on that? I'd probably lean towards a, a healthy C for him. I'd agree with a lot of what Aaron said there in terms of his approach has been good. He's avoided the big mistakes, the rookie errors, been very, very sensible in that regard. Safe pair of hands, sensible in races. I think the big problem is just that speed. Now, 
he can have some time to unlock that speed. He's up against Bottas, good teammate. But that pace deficit, certainly in dry conditions, is, is the big concern. Obviously, his strong qualifying performances have been in the wet, which is always a, a good sign, shows he's got some of the fundamentals. But just that dry pace is just a little bit too far off uh, my liking. And that's what I'd like to see more of from him. If he can find that, then he's got the makings of a very effective F1 driver. The question is whether he can. But yeah, he's had a, a very, very respectable season. He probably should have a few more points than he's got. He is very much the second driver there, but I like his sensible approach. He's been aiming to rack up the Q2s. He's not got too overexcited trying to catch Bottas, but it's whether he can make that step from this sort of learning period and actually unleash some really, really strong pace in the, in the future, certainly in the dry. So that, that's what I'd like to see from him. But very good start. And certainly from where he's coming from he's done more than enough to earn a second season yeah i'm um I, i'm definitely just staying clear of judging him until next season to be honest you got to give that rookie season get through that year and then see where we go from there but uh, for someone who spent four years in f2 and uh, never really set it you know didn't really dominate it like you'd expect to some of his experience i didn't have a lot of expectation for him the fact that he's so far behind bottas when bottas is the perfect measure of just how good a car is for me it's uh, he needs to improve that that's the key thing for me if he can improve his qualifying and be closer to bottas at the start and then race with bottas don't have to match him but just race in the same race as bottas then there's there's a chance there that he might be able to form a, a decent f1 career but uh but jury's still definitely out on on uh on joe Ganyu, but uh but a c nonetheless has put him right in the middle of our drivers the last driver in the c category we're going to talk about today is alexander alban uh, making his return to formula one after a, after a year out and uh got some points on the board um early doors which was unexpected in that williams how how have you seen things go for alex this year so far ed yeah i've been really impressed with alban he's come back very strongly from the difficulties he had with red bull i was a bit concerned that that might have almost broken him but he's he's come in this year with the attitude of really wanting to establish himself as that Williams team leader to make sure that his communication is strong and to really take George Russell's mantle in that team. And he's done that to an extent pretty well. The team's still working with him to, to get the communication right and make sure that he is suitably forceful because he's a, a fairly quiet character by his nature. But he just seems like a far, far, far more complete driver and stronger presence than he was a few years ago, which I think is really good. And the fact he's done that at Williams, which is not having a good season, is very encouraging. He's had a, there been a few weekends that haven't gone as well as they should have done, but there have been some very, very strong weekends as well. And he's been getting on quite well with the car since they upgraded it. More downforce, more peaky, trickier to drive, but doing pretty well with it. So he's sort of, he's sort of in the C or B area, depending on how much you weight it for really re-establishing himself. So yeah, I like what I've seen from Alban, I think it's been impressive and turned things around. And he's just just watched the onboards. He's a completely different driver to the one who was struggling in, in 2020. Yes, in 2020, he couldn't adapt to the Red Bull and it, the, the limitations of the car didn't suit him. He couldn't do what Verstappen could do. That does ultimately come down to him. But he's shown he could be a very, very effective F1 driver with Williams. Yeah, it's definitely been a bit a successful experiment to bring him back, and uh, I'm glad he's got another chance because I was a bit a bit uh, disappointed that he got thrown out the way he did. But uh, you can fully understand why, given that his performances and and it is you know it's supposed to be tough to be in Formula One. It's not supposed to be easy by any stretch, but he deserves a chance to come back, and he's certainly grabbed that with both with both hands. Any thoughts, Aaron, on on Alban? I'm just glad that Ed mentioned the letter B because that's what I rated him as. I mean, it's much similar sentiments. I was just worried that the Red Bull torture almost has broken him and there was the George Russell effect of having to follow not just a very highly rated young driver who's going off to Mercedes, the world champions, but someone who's performed minor heroics in that car and is Alex's good mate. So... There was a lot of comparisons to be drawn. I think he's acquitted himself really well. He's sniped off those lower points where possible. His top three finishes are ninth, 10th, 11th. I think in a Williams that probably is, well, he's definitely the slowest car, but probably we'd have expected to be a bit stronger considering how they did last year. I think he's done very, very well. He's He gets a semi-free pass because Latifi has been so sort of all over the place with his his confidence. But like you said, Ed, he's 
becoming that team leader at Williams. He's staying there for another season. And if he can get that communication right and be more forceful, then, you know, almost almost the sky's the limit for Alex uh, at Williams. Maybe he needs to flee the nest, so to speak, and uh, and take the mantle at Williams and try and lead them back to glory. Yep, no, I absolutely agree agree with all that. And uh, I think everybody gave him at least a C on the Grid Talk rankings as well. So a uh, lo- lot of love floating around for Alex Albon this year. Very consistent. And we're going to talk, as I said, this is not in any particular order, but we're moving on to the Bs now. And the person we're going to talk about next is the person who was the great white hope to take the championship fight to Max Verstappen. It's Charles Leclerc has got a, a grade B from us. Now, that's that seems a little low to me, but uh, I mean... I, I say that, but there's, you know, it's an average for a reason. A lot of people have put him as a B. I personally put him as an A. What? How did you put him, Aaron? I've got him as an A because you think how well he started the season, and we know we know just how quick Charles Leclerc is over one lap, and he's he's showing now that he can put a race together and and really handle the pressure at the front. Yes, there was there is that big error at Paul Ricard. But I think you have to look at the circumstances that led up to that. Ferrari had thrown away too many points by that point through reliability and the strategy error, uh, not just at Monaco, but at Silverstone. So Leclerc was really having to push and make sure he got that victory. And obviously that came off the back of winning in Austria. So he wanted to really cement that momentum. And he just got too, literally too close to the edge <laughs> and, and off he went into the barrier. But I don't think that should detract from the fact that Charles, who's admitted himself that he's performing at a very high level, possibly the highest level he's ever performed at, that he is now one of the top echelon drivers in Formula One alongside Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton, possibly Lando Norris and George Russell. He's delivering brilliantly, even though Ferrari are trying their best to, well, they are doing their best to just wreck his championship fight through strategy and reliability. So I would expect a few more wins from him moving forward this season. And then perhaps an even stronger title tilt, but that's banking on Ferrari getting their house in order. And we've been waiting for that for 20 years. Yeah, I think the championship position has, has certainly been heavily affected by his team. I mean, he has made a few mistakes as well. He's by, been been by no means flawless. But if you look at the championship fight last year, Verstappen Hamilton, both of the drivers making multiple mistakes throughout the year. But it's just how you deal with those mistakes, come back from them, and how you attempt to recover on the day. And and Charles Leclerc's mistakes have generally been race ending, apart from maybe the the Imola spin. But uh, he's, I still think that he's still worthy of that A category. How have you got him, Ed? Yeah, he's A, no question. For me, yeah, Imola and France were the the big black marks against him. They were unforced in race errors. But think of the race he could have won. Baku, Spain, Monaco, Canada, Silverstone. He could have won all of those. It wasn't his fault that he didn't win those races. Obviously, France, he was in contention to win. That was his mistake. So we can't count that one as a lost lost win. Obviously, Hungary, yeah, the car pace in the race wasn't brilliant. But strategically, it certainly made his life much, much harder. So I think Leclerc's been really strong. The one question mark over him is the errors. So there's a couple of weekends that I heavily marked him down for because of those mistakes. But he's been stunningly quick and he's executed well for the most part when he's had the chance. Yeah, compared to Verstappen, the extra mistakes, even if Ferrari hadn't made those many, many errors, if he was tight on points, that would be making a big difference. But overall, very, very strong, stunningly quick amazing feel amazing traction sensing most of them most of the little moments he has he gets away with in catches and he's produced some really really impressive qualifying laps this year some of those really live wire ones where you see he's right on the edge which is great to see so I, th- I think he's been he's been brilliant still flawed brilliance and that's what he's got to work on if he's going to be a world champion but overall when you consider how many of those points and results are missing if you <laughs> because of because of factors nothing to do with him that are Ferrari factors I think people would judge him very differently if he had another three four five wins under his belt which he could very very easily do yeah absolutely and also in the the B category we have uh the, our first Red Bull driver Sergio Perez has been coming as a B at times this year it looked like he might have been in a championship fight uh if yeah, potentially it would have been moved aside for, for Max Verstappen if that was the case but uh but Perez, a B, Ed, is that is that right for you? I mean, I was it. I I personally put him as a B. Uh, how have you got Sergio Perez? Yeah, B seems reasonable. Obviously, it's trailed off a little bit. He's got the age-old problem of being a very good driver who is teammate to an absolutely great one, and that's the problem because the great drivers they often are able to 
have the car in a way where it's really quick, but they can live with it. They can manipulate it. They have the ability just to sort of be on that razor sharp edge that little bit more. Perez actually a few times earlier this season when the car was a bit more front limited was able to get more pace out of it. But always Verstappen's the one who'll be able to access the ultimate potential of a car that is made quicker. So that that's almost the curse that Perez is up against. And ultimately he knew that when he went to Red Bull. Yes, he aspires to win the World Championship, but he has a pretty good idea even before he was in that team of how strong Verstappen is. So I think yeah, Perez has had a, a good season. One in Monaco, Saudi Arabia pole, very unlucky in Saudi Arabia with the timing of the safety car because he pitted from the lead, would have held the lead, but then I think it was Nicholas Latifi that crashed and caused that uh, that ill-timed safety car for, for him. So yeah, good strong season, and even though there have been some pretty disappointing weekends recently, he's still coming out of it with some decent solid points, which is what he's there for. So yeah, a good season. The only downside for him is he's not the lead driver in that team, and he's not purely by status and overall ability. Very, very good, but not, not a great. And that's true of many, many Grand Prix drivers. The absolute greats are extremely rare. So no disgrace whatsoever. So I think Perez should be very, very pleased with this season, even if right now he's probably feeling a little bit disappointed. Yeah, absolutely no shame in that whatsoever. 99% of Formula One drivers are, are a, you know, at the very least a good Formula One driver. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's been patchy in places, but, you know, you just look at his performance in Silverstone where he was taken out of the race contention with no real fault of his own. And then at the end, it looked like he might have won it. So a good performance there. Aaron, anything to add on Sergio Perez? Uh, well, I rate him, rate him as a B, but like you both covered, he is a very good racing driver just not one of the greats it reminds me of uh the Coulthard Hakkinen pairing uh, at McLaren because Coulthard was an absolutely very accomplished racing driver and he showed after Hakkinen stopped that he was able to lead the team but like with Verstappen Hamilton Hakkinen Schumacher they just have this range of adaptability where it doesn't quite matter so much what the car is able to do they'll find a way to drive it fast and find a way to win a race in a world championship. Yeah, absolutely. And next up then we have Carlos Sainz, the second of the Ferrari drivers, also in the B category. I don't disagree that he probably falls in the B category, but I do, as we've already covered, disagree he falls in the same category as, as Charles Leclerc. But Aaron, how did you, how did you grade Carlos Sainz this season? I've rated him as a B because it started okay. And then, it, it seemed to lack consistency and there was a few errors uh, the the off in Australia where he just seemed to see red and uh, ended up in the gravel and then in Imola could have been on pole but threw it in the barrier and then he seemed to lose a lot of confidence he's had reliability but he's got his act together and he was driving brilliantly he got the first win at Silverstone you know he stood up to the team because he told them stop inventing and, you know, we've seen Vettel have to drive the strategy at, at Ferrari and, you know, he, he took control of that situation. He took control again in Paul Ricard when they were messing around with strategy. Recently, he's found some pace. So I think there is reason for optimism with Carlos Sainz, but whether he's got the, and I've always thought this, Charles Leclerc is the X-factor driver at Ferrari and Carlos Sainz is what you'd call sort of your, your Mr. Sunday. He would He would deliver a very consistent, race performance but he's not necessarily going to go and take every race by the scruff of the neck from pole position and, and just walk away with it in a way that Charles Leclerc probably could do yeah absolutely solid driver Carlos Sainz uh, multiple race winner hopefully in the future and and we'll, we'll, we'll have many many good seasons ahead of him but probably not quite in that top echelon of of driver Ed any thoughts on on Carlos Sainz and where did you grade him yeah B as well if it was Judge based on the past five or six races, he'd probably be knocking on the door of a, an A because he has improved a lot. But yeah, ultimately, he doesn't have that last little extra bit, the X factor, as uh, as uh, as Aaron put it, in terms of that pace. But he is very, very good at just working at himself, working at the car, keeps picking himself up. He's just sort of relentlessly working and he, he's eventually able to haul himself up to that level, which I think he's done very, very well this year but we've still seen it even recently for example look at Austria where Leclerc had that clear small edge and then Hungary science really should have had pole but couldn't quite put it together uh, and missed out so 
yeah, there's always these little rough edges, but I've been impressed with science's attitude and the way he's recovered from those those troubles early on, particularly Australia, where it was just a lap and a half of madness, really, just <laughs> after the problem he'd had in qualifying, didn't get a good launch, started to try and make rushed overtakes. So he lost a few more places on that first lap. Then just the, the moment we eventually went off, he wasn't very happy with that particular moment. He knew exactly what he'd done wrong there. So, yeah, science is, he's continuing to push against that that kind of Leclerc ceiling where it's correct. He is sort of seen as the number two driver there at Ferrari, but he just keeps pushing, trying to reel Leclerc in. And I think he'll keep doing that, even though on a given day, you would expect Leclerc just to have that little bit of a an edge of pace, which you would have over pretty much every driver because he is stunningly quick. So science, yeah, really, really good job in a, a, a tricky situation. Yep, yeah, no, Carlos Sainz is uh, um, one of my favourite drivers I've mentioned before. He's, uh, I, I just really hope he does do well. But we'll move on to someone who is definitely up there with a lot of people's favourite drivers. Lando Norris is in the B category. It looked like last year he he could potentially have been pushing for for race wins, and uh, but but just not really come about from from McLaren this year. But at least he's he's thoroughly beating his teammate Ed. And and how do you how do you see Norris's uh, Norris's season gone so far? Has, is he living up to his expectation? Yeah, I think he is, ultimately. If you look at it, I've got him in the A category simply because the McLaren's limited, but he's firmly best of the rest. He had that great podium at Imola. Consistently in the points, he's often pointing up, uh, popping up 6th, 7th, 8th in races, doing a really good job. Obviously, he's crushing Daniel Ricciardo utterly, just as he was last year. So, yeah, I think Norris is, is really doing a good job in a car that we know is very, very tricky. I think to achieve that level of consistency in a car that is inconsistent not just in its overall pace and where it is in the midfield but also it does have little moments where there's these sort of little arrow stalls here and there and it can be a bit unpredictable and he deals with it very very well it's not his natural style that he's driving to either so he's gone through that process that Ricardo's been trying to go through of adapting to it very very well so I've been impressed with this season yeah the results haven't been there but the car hasn't been there so what else can you do other than just drive around and keep picking up consistent bottom half of the points finishes because that's what the car's capable of at best. Yeah, just ask Lewis Hamilton what it's like driving a car that isn't capable of winning races. And yeah, it's uh, it's... It's, it's, it's going to be difficult to judge him on this season. Get him in a winning car, see how he does in the championship fight. I can't wait for that to happen. And I hope it happens soon. Aaron, any thoughts on Lando Norris's season? Well, there's just something that Nico Rosberg said, I think it was on uh, the French Grand Prix weekend on Sky F1, where maybe people were judging... A Daniel Ricciardo against a Lando Norris that we thought was maybe upper midfield at best. Maybe if we start thinking about Lando Norris as a world champion in waiting and his his talent and his performances this season and last season have suggested that, maybe that shows that Daniel Ricciardo isn't doing quite such a, a bad job on his good days. And Lando obviously has spoken about how he's had to go through that process of adapting. It's not the natural way for him to drive the car. I just, I just think he's absolutely doing a phenomenal job with what he's got to, to work with at the moment. That's not to slight what McLaren are doing. They're building a new infrastructure. Uh, I think their wind tunnel comes online, is it next year or the, the year after? So, yeah, that, that should then lead to another step in performance and they can make sure that all their working practices are good. Whose teammate's going to be is, you know, still up for debate <laughs> that's that's the merry-go-round that that won't stop at the moment uh, but for for Norris he's almost that one constant at McLaren at the moment that's just able to deliver those good performances race in race out deliver what the car is capable of like Ed said and just snipe off those lower half top 10 finishes and he gets the most out of the car more often than not you look at his performance in Hungary in qualifying where he, he got it fourth on the grid which was just superb and no one expected, even on a good weekend, for the McLaren to be that high up. So, yeah, worthy of a B stroke an A. I rated him as a B. Yeah, very consistent performer, Lando Norris. But, uh, but yeah, good good all-round season for him. Not quite uh, the finished article yet. Very similar to, to Charles Leclerc in that, but certainly in that, in that top bracket. Someone who has wanted to push into that top bracket but has never quite managed to get there yet is Esteban Ocon. He's the next person we're going to talk about still in that B category, Aaron. And 
It seems a lot closer to, well, ahead of Fernando Alonso in the championship as well at the moment, but uh, a lot of that down to circumstance. And if you believe Fernando Alonso, he's lost 80, 90, no, 100 points because of issues that are out of his control. So uh, how have you rated Esteban Ocon season? I've rated him as an A because he's going up against the greatest driver that's ever lived, obviously, who delivers the best race at every race. You know, how can you not rate Esteban as an A? Um, but speaking seriously, I think, Esteban has been reliable and consistent. And I think that was what was missing from his game ahead of this season. And he's just been, he's just been able to deliver those solid points. He's got a best of fifth and a sixth, se uh, seventh on three occasions. You know, he's eighth in the driver's championship. He's just behind Lando Norris, who's, who we've just spoken about, who's doing amazing things in the McLaren. So Ocon is starting to deliver, I think, on the promise that he showed as a young driver and convince Mercedes to help him through, I think people sort of maybe, maybe put a bit of a slight on him because he's racing with Alpine and they always seem to underperform or find a way to shoot themselves in the foot, whether that's by producing a dud of a car or losing two drivers at once. But Esteban is really showing that he's ready to lead, especially now in Alonso's absence. So he's able to take that team forwards, mold it into his own team. And, you know, maybe, well, maybe he can add to his victory in Hungary uh, last year uh, in the future with Alpine. Possible, it's possible. I, I'm I'm less of a knock-on fanboy than yourself. I only rated him as a C myself, but I think I was the lowest person. Myself and James were the only person people that put him as lower than a B. So maybe I'm just being particularly harsh on Esteban Ocon. Uh, or am I, Ed? Am I being harsh? Well, I can see where you're coming from. I put him as a B. You might argue a very high C, but he's been really consistent. 10 points finishes out 13. He's could have been... 12 out of 13, but he had a fuel pump failure at uh, Silverstone and he had a penalty at Monaco. That was of his own making with Hamilton. Three penalties for causing collisions in races this year does show a slight weakness in his game. That has cost him. And I think probably he needs to just find that little bit more judgment in the wheel-to-wheel -wheel stuff. You remember him clattering Sonoda at the first lap at Paul Ricard. And his ultimate peaks aren't quite where Alonso's are. That's the other thing that, that just makes you think, it's not quite a territory for him, but he has had a very, very good, convincing, strong season. He's been there racking up the points. He's probably had a little bit less bad luck than Alonso has. Alonso hasn't lost quite as many points as he's claimed, but it's it's kind of 30 up to 50 points. You can legitimately argue he's lost 50 if you take the most generous interpretation. Probably 30 he, he's lost through no fault of his own. Plus Alonso's lost a few through his own fault as well. But he doesn't like us talking about those, obviously. So yeah, Ocon's had a, had a good season and it is difficult being measured up against an Alonso who is operating at a high level. So I think he's had a very, very good season and that's why nobody's talking about him at the point when Alpine driver futures are all up in the air simply because he's, he's locked in and he's doing the job. So there's no reason for Alpine to look anywhere else, really. Yeah, OK, that's fair enough. So we'll, we'll, I'll actually talk about Alonso next. I'm going slightly out of order from what I've got written in front of me. We're going to talk about Alonso next. He's still in that B category, very close to his teammate in the uh, in the order. But uh, yeah, Ed, how have you... Uh, obviously, you've already touched on Fernando Alonso and his and the amount of points that he's lost or hasn't lost, as the case may be. But beyond that, how have you got him uh, performing for the season? Yeah, I think he's sort of low A, high B. He's performed very well. And... He has had some misfortune and some bad luck, but he's pulled out some very good qualifying laps. And to be fair, qualifying laps aren't historically his absolute trump card in terms of how strong he is. It's on Sundays where he's absolutely relentlessly, except relentlessly exceptional. He's had a few moments when he's been his own worst enemy. You know, the Canada weaving penalty with Bottas was a slam dunk. The, the Miami thing, when he was playing a few little games and the stewards didn't really like how clever he was trying to be with things so even though he gave the time back he had affected the race situation fundamentally so he ended up dropping out the points with that penalty and I think he also hit Gasly in that race but by and large he's been doing a, a really really good job yeah he is Mr Self-Promotion in saying how well he's performing but you can't really argue with what he's doing on track he still is a very 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 effective good Grand Prix driver I've got no doubt that in a race winning car, he'd still be capable of getting race wins. As it is, he's the guy that has had the absolute highest points from the, the Alpine, probably for Ocon, it's Austria that was his highest point all round weekend. But Alonso may possibly have been potentially quicker in the, in the race there, but he had the problem with the sprint race grid. So we didn't get a chance to see that. He'd look quicker up to the end of qualifying. So 
yeah, I think Alonso's been really, really strong. A few little shoot himself in the foot moments, but otherwise just delivering week in, week out, which is why he's such a great loss, I think, to Alpine. Yeah, well, that's making my grade for, as a C for for Fernando Alonso looking particularly bad with that kind of rationale. So, uh, Aaron, uh, how have you rated Fernando Alonso? I've rated him as a B. I mean, he can't have any complaints about some of his points losses because, like you mentioned, Ed, the Miami one changed the the complexion of the race in that area of the field. The weaving one with Bottas was just I don't know. You might as well you gonna if you weave, you're gonna get a penalty and lose the place anyway. So you might as well just defend on the brakes as best as possible uh, in that situation. But he has been ferociously quick, just as we know Fernando can be. It's a very funny thing. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Alonso because he burst onto the scene. He stopped Schumacher's run of success. He was the next best thing alongside Kimi Raikkonen. And then it's just all sort of petered out in uh, quarrelling and moving teams and trying IndyCar and Dakar and... I just don't think he's ever reached the success that he should have done. And I think that maybe clouds my judgment of him because I always think there should be more to come from Fernando because he shows it pretty regularly. He talk, he tells us all about it, just how good he is. And he does show it on the track. That that qualifying lap in Canada, a rare breed of driver can produce that because you have to be exceptional to deliver that sort of lap time in a car that isn't a front-running car. So that still tells you that he can win races in a race winning car, whether he could win the world championship against some of these young hot shoes would be quite interesting because he'd, he'd try and play all sorts of games with them, but they'd, they'd know exactly what he's up to. It's a huge loss for Alpine that they should have got their house in order a bit quicker, but if Aston Martin pull out a car that's worthy of the name next year, Alonso could be well set or it's going to be another one of those terrible career moves. I think that the money for me would be on the terrible career move. It's just kind of like his modus operandi is just <laughs> what Fernando does. So moving on then to, to Valtteri Bottas is, is next up. And uh, after what looked like you could potentially been heading out of Formula One, he's definitely had a bit of a bit of a revival here in his time at Alfa Romeo. Alfa Romeo looking like a better team than they were last year, Aaron. And, uh, and, but it's just been a few moments for me where he, he's, he could have done better. And, uh, but, that's why I eventually put him as a C, but I was on the bottom end of what people put him as. How, how have you put Bottas this season? Uh, I've rated him as an A because uh, Bottas version 8.4 has just been superb. He he could have uh, had the stuffing knocked out of him losing that, that Mercedes drive and moving to Alfa Romeo. And I think he's been fortunate in the fact that the, the Alfa has been competitive. So he can continue to show that he is high quality racing driver and obviously if the car had been stuck at the back like it has been the last few seasons we'd have seen him limited to you know the, the odd points finish in the, in the same way that Kimi Raikkonen was and maybe became a bit more of a meme than you know a respected world champion Grand Prix winning racing driver but, but Bottas has just been superb for me his results have been strong his best result uh, was fifth in Imola he's all of his top three results are in in the points he's just absolutely excellent and when the car's on form he's able to deliver and he's he's guiding Zhou Guan Yu along very nicely the recent performance for Alfa Romeo hasn't been quite as strong but he's definitely the sort of guy who's going to pull that team forward and keep them in the midfield and he's just he's just doing a very good job and I think it's really nice for Bottas having spent five years as you know almost the whipping boy to Lewis Hamilton you know and a lot, a lot of drivers would have been in that situation um, and that, that doesn't mean that Bottas is a rubbish racing driver. He's now showing just how good he is. You know, if he hadn't just spent five years at Mercedes, everyone would be going, hey, put him in a Mercedes, put him in a Ferrari. <laughs> oh, God, no more. No more handbot ver podiums, please. Yeah, I mean, I, it looks looking on the face of it, my grade of a C looks quite harsh. But then I look at the few drivers that are ahead of him in that list, and I all think they're better drivers. So I'm going to stand by my rating of a C for that. Ed, any, any advancement on Valtteri Bottas? Yeah, I think I'd like him to be a, a B, perhaps a high B. I think he's had a very strong season. He's, to his credit, really accepted where he is in his career. He's not dropped down the grid reluctantly, if you like. He's accepted he's had his shot with a top team and he's had plenty of wins, a lot of success, but he's really embraced the challenge and he's really enjoying it. He's, he's having a lovely time, no question. And he is driving very, very 
Well, there have been a few little areas of inconsistency. The odd mistake Miami made an error that let the Mercedes drivers past, but he's been consistently good and very much relishing being the focal point of that team. And yeah, as was mentioned, very much a team player, really taking an active interest in Joe's development, which is really good to see. So I think Bottas is doing a very, very good job and it is showing how good he is ultimately. Yes, it's a bit easier when you're not being measured up every weekend against one of these all-time greats in, in Hamilton. That's the nature of the beast, but it's a different challenge and he settled in really, really well and he's being well paid, but Alfa Romeo, Salva are getting absolutely their money's worth out of, out of Bottas. Just need the car to take a bit more of a step so he can consistently be scoring those points again and make a little bit of an improvement in terms of the reliability side. But it's a team that's improving and I think Bottas over the next few years should be able to help it be a more effective race team. So yeah, very, very good season for him. And most importantly, I think he's just enjoying life, which is good to see because sometimes you do see drivers in that situation a bit embittered, but not Bottas. He's, he's just really having a genuinely lovely time. Yeah, and another one who's having a great time, someone who wasn't even expecting to be racing in Formula One until just before the start of the season. Kevin Magnussen is the last of our B categories. Uh, so I, again, rated him as, as a C in this. Ed, how have you got Magnussen's season? Yeah, I put him as a C because he's delivering exactly what we know Kevin Magnussen does. It's a mixed bag of some really well-executed race drives, some rash moments in races, a few weekends where he struggles to put it together as he should do in qualifying, doing a good job for Haas, but he is a mixed bag, Magnussen. His peaks are great, but this is just what you get out of Kevin Magnussen. And I think that's exactly what Haas wanted ultimately, and he's really helped revitalise that team. So I put him as a C, but it's a good C, if you, if you see what I mean. But he is still the same driver with the same limitations. He's a good midfield Grand Prix driver, competitive, for better or worse, that sometimes that works for him, sometimes it doesn't. But if you think of it, like the incidents like just messing up on the first lap at Spain when he was trying to pass Hamilton and just turned in on a car that was that was there was just self defeating. And likewise, his positioning in Canada with, again with with Hamilton, you sort of think, well, what are you expecting to happen? At best, you end up where you are anyway. You don't have any damage. At worst, you do have some damage. So he's still not great at measuring those up, but he can also de- produce these really really well executed race drive so yeah it's just a it's a mixed bag you never quite know what you're going to get with Magnussen but you know that over a season you'll get a chunk of good and a chunk of frustrating yeah absolutely and uh, pretty much all uh, B's and C's all round for, for, from the Grid Talk crew Aaron how have you got uh <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just the exception to all these rules. Um I've got him as an A because I, I just I just think like coming from what was almost a standing start to return to Formula One, he had a whole program with Peugeot, his IMSA stuff. He wasn't prepared at all mentally, physically to be getting into a Formula One car this year. And yet on his return, he, yeah, okay, the Haas got a, a little bit of dispensation in testing and he was fastest and that that caught the headlines. And then he went and followed it up in Bahrain with fifth place, which, okay, if Red Bull had finished the race, it would have been seventh, but that's still a great result for a guy who's walked back into the team and is not in the physical condition to take on a Formula One machine, especially one that behaves like a pogo stick. But he's had some, like Ed said, some really good, really good results but he could have had more if he didn't have those bumps and bangs with Lewis Hamilton. Uh, I think he had one in, was it in France? He had a collision. Or there was one quite recently as well after Canada. I can't remember where, but there's potential for more. But I just think the way he's come in, he's made what was a very unhappy Haas team over the last few years. All of a sudden it's transformed. The, the atmosphere in that team is much more positive. Gunther Steiner is no longer a meme. He's an actual team principal who, you know, when people listen, when you listen to him, it's not just, oh, you know, we're just waiting for him to say something funny. There's actual detail in what they're saying and they're achieving things on the track. Whereas last year they were just running around at the back and the world was imploding for them. But he's come back in, he's galvanised that team. Everything is much more happy, much more positive. And I think that just speaks volumes. Because if, if, if you've got a happy environment, you're going to achieve things. And achieving for Haas at the moment 
is obviously staying on on the grid and scoring points finishes, and that's what Kevin is delivering. He definitely deserves uh, an, another shot at F1, in, in my opinion, definitely. But uh, yeah, it's be interesting to see what happens in the coming years with this multi-year deal finally for him. Be interesting to see how he how he reacts next season as well. So um, with, that's the last of our B categories. Just three drivers left to talk about, and the first driver we're going to talk about in the A category. Everybody on Grid Talk on the Grid Talk panel gave him an A, except for me, who gave him a B, and my monkey seat co-host who gave him an E. But we won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> Aaron, your thoughts on George Russell? Oh, George is brilliant, isn't he? he that pole position, right? I, because I'm an F1 writer, I tried to be impartial, but I was jumping around with joy when George Russell got that pole position because it was such a massive surprise. And I think that, like, when drivers get those first poles, like Lando Norris's last year in Russia, when it's a bit more of a out of the blue, it, it hits home. That, that it's real quality. It's not just, oh, he's got a good car. He's got the fastest car. Of course, he's going to be on pole position. George pulled something out of the bag. He got the tyres in the right window and he delivered the lap. And he's been delivering all season. You know, he's gone into Lewis Hamilton's team and done a brilliant job with a car that has been misbehaving. Let's just put it that way. And he's helped guide the team in the right direction. Yes, it does help if you've got a teammate who's done. Uh, 300 races and has won seven more championships. He's got a lot of experience, but put yourself in that situation. I think he's, he's lived up to the hype basically this year. He's shown that if Mercedes, well, when Mercedes get that car sorted, he will be a contender for race wins for world championships in the future. He's just been absolutely superb. I think he's probably exceeded many people's expectations because everyone would have expected Hamilton to be, the lead driver and in many respects recently he has been but they had so many issues to sort out so I think Hamilton took the burden of that and was trying to help solve the problems for the team which allowed George to have less pressure to settle in deliver those strong results and build that confidence and now you're seeing it all come together they've been on the podium second and third in both of the previous two races before the summer break what more can Mercedes achieve in this season that I think they're going to win a race absolutely I absolutely hope so. And, and if you'd have asked me on the start line at the British Grand Prix what I would be grading George Russell, I would have been 100% agree with you and gone with the A. But the reason I dropped him down to a B was just the way things have changed around in the last few weeks and just doesn't seem to have the the, the same pace as Lewis Hamilton and just that little error that I, I attribute to him on the, on, on the British Grand Prix. That's why I put him as a B. But uh, Ed, what, what's, your, uh, what's your opinion on George Russell this year? He's had a very strong season. I think you put him high B, low A, depending on how harsh you were being with using the, the grades. He has been very, very strong consistently. I think everywhere apart from Silverstone, he's been in the top five by the end of races. And he's really established himself as a guy capable of running consistently at the front. And that hungry pole was really well executed. It's always great when someone pulls something a bit unexpected out of the bag. He just strung together the lap when others, mainly in Ferraris around him, didn't. And obviously Verstappen had his problem so just capitalized on that opportunity and did a really really good lap he reckoned that was the first Williams style qualifying special he's produced for Mercedes so yeah impressive from him I, I do agree we've seen a little bit recently Hamilton asserting himself a little bit in terms of outright pace that's not by a massive margin and probably to be expected so I think Russell's done a, a very very good job the first half season he can be very very pleased with and considering how difficult it's been for the team, the struggles with porpoising and bouncing. The car's not been easy at times, particularly earlier in the year. It would have been very, very easy for him just to get lost amongst all that and just underperform. But he's just worked through it, done the job, and he's come out with his reputation enhanced, which I think is all you can ask for a, a driver in their first shot in a top car. So, yeah, he, he's done an excellent job, and there's no question he'll be winning races in the future. And... We don't really know how anyone will stand up to a world championship fight until they're in them, but Russell's certainly ticking all the boxes that he needs to to earn that chance. 
Yeah, it's absolutely lived up to the hype, and there's no shame whatsoever in uh, in being very, very close to Lewis Hamilton's pace. And uh, I know he's he, and the fact that he is even ahead of him in the championship still shows what a great season he's had. And definitely, definitely, in a couple of years' time, we can see him uh, equaling or maybe even passing Lewis Hamilton certainly for, for performance. But we're going to talk about Lewis Hamilton now, as he is another driver in this in this A category. Again, if you'd have asked me on Silverstone to grade him, I probably would have put him as a B. But he certainly has uh, just stepped things up massively in the last the last sort of th- three months and uh it's hamilton still got still got it still you know can you see him getting that eighth championship now yeah i don't think really there was a point in the season when the ability to do that was a concern yeah he had a few shaky races earlier on or weekends i should say obviously saudi arabia and imola were the ones that stood out as fairly poor it was difficult to untangle his performance personally and the experiments that were being run on his car but since the cars sorted, kind of Azerbaijan, Canada onwards, he's been very, very strong, as you'd expect. And he's shown that he's not letting his head drop. He's not just saying the car's not good enough, I can't be bothered. I think there's a really renewed determination there, which I don't think is any great surprise. So, yeah, depending on how you wait the season, he's a high B or an A, isn't he? Very, very easily. And certainly over the second half of the first half of the year, uh, to put it that slightly clumsy way, then he's definitely a, a, an A. So yeah, he's still the driver he was and he's responded very, very well to some adversity and a car like Russell that's very, very tricky. It would have been very, very easy for Mercedes to have much worse results this year if they had a, a less strong driver pairing. But those two have, have really done a good job. Yeah, definitely for me, the strongest driver pairing on the grid. Uh, Aaron, you've uh, how have you got Lewis Hamilton for the season? I've rated him as a B, but then... Lewis is my favourite driver, so I'm always going to judge him slightly more harshly or be uh, more forgiving. He's recovered his season as well, a bit like Carlos Sainz, where it was a bit of a slow start. Obviously, there was the issues with the car. And obviously, like I mentioned earlier, he took the burden of experimentation and solving the issues with the team for that. And he had his motivation question as well, because sometimes in his interviews, he came across a little bit deflated but if you look back over the course of even the championship winning is on those weekends where things didn't go Lewis's way he always had less spring in his step and I think that's what sets the very best apart because he he could have finished second had a great race and he'll go no that wasn't good enough Lewis expects the best from not just himself but from his his team and everyone around him so he's now found his groove And you can see that mojo coming back. He's so happy that the team have been able to produce a reliable car. And he's he's mentioned that a lot. So that's been sort of his mantra. We're reliable. We're we're reliable. Almost as though saying, you know, Ferrari, you know, we've seen how badly they're shooting themselves in the foot. And Red Bull, they've been pretty good recently. But at the start of the season, they had a few hiccups. So there's still that potential. Mercedes haven't had a mechanical DNF yet. Um, And, you know, Record uh, clip this for when they both retire on the first lap at Belgium, and then replay it back to me. Yeah, Lewis has has found his groove. He's he's probably going to win a race because that's just what Lewis Hamilton does. He's been excellent the last few rounds. He could have won at Silverstone, but for that safety car, again, I think at Hungary, if he'd been on the front row alongside George, he probably wins the race because he's got that little bit extra race pace. But you know, for, for me, a B because I think there's. You know, he did he did a little bit of selfless work at the start of the season to you know help the car get better and now we're seeing the the fruits of that labor yeah absolutely it's it's all, it's all as as ed said there is it a high b low a how have you how have you want to put it it's all uh, it's all very very close and still you know showing that he's absolutely on top of his game but we started off with someone who had a category all to their own in nicholas latifi with an f and we're going to finish with max verstappen having the a plus category all to himself Virtually everybody on the Grid Talk panel gave him an A plus, including including myself. Aaron, A plus or another C? <laughs> uh, this was an A plus. Whatever you think of Verstappen and whatever you think of Red Bull and the people who run the Red Bull team, they have done the best job this year because they were what forty odd points behind uh, Leclerc after Australia, and it looked like Ferrari had this thing in the bag, but then. Ferrari became Ferrari and Red Bull made good decisions on the pit wall. They've developed their car. Verstappen has got his groove. 
you've won three three races in a row and then you know okay there was a few team orders but he's earned that because he is the world champion he's just been outstanding and you know the the win in hungary that was the last thing i think we've yet to see from verstappen was a win almost out of nowhere yeah he had his win in his first race for for red bull but a win from you know real adversity hmm. where he's you know really on the back foot and hungary was exactly that and him and his team got everything done he was fast when he needed to be and it, that's just the story of his season they've been on the back foot and they've responded both team and driver working completely in unison he's walking away with this title which you know as a you know from a neutral perspective is kind of annoying because we had a such a great battle last year we could be having a great battle this year but through Leclerc and Ferrari's errors we're not but Verstappen and and Red Bull are doing the best job so we shouldn't criticize them for walking away with the title because they are doing a better job than everybody else Absolutely, and and just we just got to hope that the, uh, the the technical director that comes in at Spa does something to uh, to drop the, uh, the 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 dominance down a bit. But equally, it's probably going to affect Ferrari as much as as Red Bull. And I can't see Mercedes making such a big jump, but we can but hope. What about you? And I'll give you the the, the last word. Any uh, any hope for the season? And and how have you got Verstappen? Yeah, I think the championship is firmly going the way of yeah. Max Verstappen and Red Bull, short of some kind of reliability cataclysm. I think even then, Ferrari would probably struggle to make the most of it. Verstappen's been superb. Very few errors. Yeah, he had the, the spin in Spain, caught out by a bit of wind. Beyond that, it's all been minor. Qualifying laps haven't perhaps been quite the standard of last year. He's not entirely at one with the car, but they've always still been very good. So those are very, very minor criticisms but he's been superb yeah the, the race drive in Hungary was superb probably the strongest weekend was Canada where he really nailed it in qualifying as well could very very easily have been behind a Ferrari in that race but just through doing the job really well he made sure he was ahead of science and then once ahead at the start he was always in a strong position so yeah just metronomically good he is the the complete package for Stappen and he's going about winning a championship this year in a very different way to last year because it's a completely different championship. Easier in a way because it's not just that ridiculous, relentless competition that we saw last year, but he's just approaching every weekend in the right way. If he's got damage like he did at Silverstone, he finishes seventh, he's happy with that. He thinks, well, I've done the job. He's not getting excessively frustrated in the car. Yeah, when things go wrong, he'll complain, but that doesn't seem to impact his driving in any particular way. So he's, he's doing everything. Yeah, Ferrari have handed him wins, but it's because he's always been there in the right place. He's put pressure on. There have been races where he might well have been able to still defeat Ferrari, but Ferrari removed themselves before <laughs> there, was a, there was a battle to be resolved. So, yeah, just really outstanding, Max Verstappen, no question whatsoever. He's a, he's a driver who... Ultimately, he's on his way through his second championship. So he's he's firmly established as, as a great now rather than just a great in the making. And it's just a question of just how much of an all-time great he's on his way to becoming. The only thing that stops us from saying that is he's still ridiculously young. Was he only 24? So there could be a lot more of this. And I'm sure there will be. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant driver. And I've no doubt that if Ferrari was posing a stronger threat, he'd still be formidable and in a very very good position because he's he's just got it all as a race driver yeah it's a scary scary thing a, a maturing max verstappen uh could could see lots of championships coming his way provided red bull continue to provide him with the equipment to do it well, what's your thoughts on our driver ratings do you agree with us or are you frantically unsubscribing as we speak uh, well let us know your opinions and the great thing about sport is that everyone has a valid opinion and we would love to hear from you so you can you can follow us at f1 chronicle and i am at tom horrocks f1 on twitter if you want to follow me aaron where can people go to find out more from you uh, so you can find me on Twitter, Aaron Harper 41. You can find my podcast. Uh, it's called the five red lights. F1 podcast, which also has a Twitter account, uh, five underscore red underscore lights. Uh, so I write for F1 Chronicle and I contribute to inside F2. Fantastic. Lots and lots of strings to your bow there then. And Ed, if people want to hear more from you, where should they go? Well, on the off chance, uh, I'm to be found a lot at the race, head to the race.com to have a look there. The race F1 podcast I, I host as well. And I turn up in a few other places uh, as well. So there's plenty of chances to be extensively bored by me all over the place. If you ever hear anyone mention an Andrea Moda, I'm sure you'll hear Ed voice uh, shortly afterwards. <laughs> 
Well, thank you very much to our audience for, for today. And we will be back soon. We've got plenty more mid-season content before we return in Spa. So we look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye. <laughs>